Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 218. It's okay not to be okay, as long as you don't stay that way. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Black Box, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content. And you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Black Box currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Black Box is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Black Box, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Black Box takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. Today's show is also sponsored by AmazingMusicTracks.com. Amazing Music Tracks is an online licensing platform that offers production music created by award-winning Hollywood film composers. Their composers are responsible for music behind feature film hits like Easy A and Legion, trailers including Guardians of the Galaxy and The Hobbit, and much more. What's awesome about this service is that you only pay a one-time fee and you can use the music on unlimited film projects in perpetuity. Over the next couple weeks, AmazingMusicTracks.com is offering a subscription model that can receive up to 70% off each music track. Trust me, if you do a lot of film production, you should definitely take advantage of this opportunity. So head over to AmazingMusicTracks.com. So today on the show, we are going to talk about algorithms and data to help you sell your movie with two warriors that are going to war for you guys every day trying to find ways to help you make money with your movies Liz Manichel and Jess Fuchsley from the Sundance Creative Distribution Fellowship are hard at work trying to figure out how to use data to help filmmakers sell their movie. So at Sundance, I sat down with them and talked a little bit about data gathering, what they're doing with their uh, fellowship program as well, and what they're learning from filmmakers that are going through the program and hopefully going to be releasing and are releasing this information to the to the public, to other indie filmmakers, to help them get a better understanding of what it really takes to get their movie out there. And I also want to thank my partner, Media Circus PR, for co-producing the series of Sundance podcast. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Liz and Jess from the Sundance Institute. I'd like to welcome to the show Liz Manichel and Jess Fusley. Thank you guys for coming in. Liz is a returning champion to our show. I'm a three Pete, Alex. You actually are one of the first wow. three Pete's yeah. to the show. Yeah. That is, and you're the first back to back guest yeah. ever in history of. I'm really great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and her humble. She's very, very <laughs> humble. She's extremely humble yeah. as well. So, uh, everyone who's listened to the podcast before knows Liz works for Sundance. Uh, and now, Liz, after the last podcast, what kind of <laughs> reaction? I warned you. Yeah. I did warn you. You're just like, no, just give my email out. It'll be fine. Right. I'm like, Liz, are you sure? No, nah, it's all good. What happened? Uh, I got a lot of emails. <laughs> uh, so basically, I went on your podcast to publicize our fellowship, the Creative Distribution Fellowship at Sundance. And I think at the time we had like 30 applications. And now we have 120, nice. I think. And those aren't don't even count the drafts. So we probably have around 200. That's awesome. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. But I still want people to email me. I'm like a glutton for punishment. I really like email. So I'll put I'll put your email okay, in the show you. notes still, as well. I just I'm so lonely. <laughs> All right. So. Good, good. So we brought some success and hopefully going to help some film yeah, get out thank there. thank you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, what you do as well. Now, Jess, what do you do at the all-powerful uh, Sundance? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am with Liz in the Creative Distribution Initiative, mm-hmm. um, and I manage education and research, okay. uh, which is which is kind of a, a really interesting hybrid right now, especially with 
where the market is at and the different trends that are going on in distribution. But um, basically what I do is I, I work with data, all the data we can get access to, and figure out ways we can craft educational resources for filmmakers that help them find more sustainable avenues, um, specifically within the distribution space. And I think that's something that's so under-talked about is sustainability as a career. Mm -hmm. You know, filmmaking, and you know, you're a filmmaker, we're all filmmakers, we've all made you know, films and stuff. And, and, you know, you, you push everything out to that one movie and that's mm. the thing. And if it doesn't pop and make you a millionaire, then what? And I think that's the model. It's like this kind of lottery ticket model. Yeah. That's horrible. It's very unhealthy. It's yeah. extremely yeah. unhealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, you can't sustain a career doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what you guys are trying to do is maintain, like, look guys, you can't look at this as one project. You gotta look at this as a career next five, 10, 15 years. So t we talked yeah. a little bit about what you were doing um, in regards to data collection. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really interesting. What are you doing mm -hmm. with data collection to help filmmakers? Sure. Um, so we're starting with these really robust case studies of our two inaugural fellows that are going through the Creative Distribution Fellowship right now. Uh, that's Columbus and Unrest. Mm -hmm. um, and we've followed them throughout their entire process, right? And part of the stipulations of the fellowship is that our fellows are completely open with us and honest and willing to share their information. Um, so we've been on weekly calls from with them since day one. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very much like that's our, our first, those are going to be the first big pieces coming out of our department that are very data driven. So talking about how much they spent on PNA and how that was divided. Was it majority PR? Was it majority digital marketing? Um, certain things like that. And then even breaking out within those spaces, where did the money go to? Mm -hmm. um, and then also just the returns that they're seeing on the different revenue streams. So theatrical and TVOD and what was their strategy? What was their windowing strategy? So really breaking it down to all of the granular details. Mm -hmm. So filmmakers can glean insights from that and, you know, pick and choose what they want to take from that as far as what helps them the most. Um, and then from there, we're also working on something called the Transparency Project. Um, so the Transparency Project started a couple years ago. Um, it was a very ambitious tool mm -hmm. um, where we were basically trying to get information on the performance of films to feed this tool, and then filmmakers would be able to use it to get sample projections on their future work. That would be amazing. Yes, that would be incredible. That would be, that would be um, fantastic. That would be fantastic. But, but we're not doing um, <laughs> But that's completely not happening. <laughs> I, I will say this. Um, I have a tech background. I was a coder for about four years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really ambitious thing to do. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there right now who are starting to do that work um, and doing it well, mm -hmm. you know, and finding the sources. And so, you know, I think as an institute in our department specifically really felt that the best way we could transform the transparency project would be finding ways to craft educational resources that aren't just driven by anecdotal information, mm -hmm. but are driven in concrete facts. You know, the data that we have access to as an institute, we're very fortunate, right? Mm -hmm. We support a, a lot of incredible filmmakers. Um, we see a lot of different models come in and out of the institute. So how can we use that information to really open the doors up for filmmakers and, and help them figure out what's going to be the best avenue for their project? So the Transparency Project 2.0 um, mm -hmm. is going to be a collection of resources, uh, you know, case studies, you know, kind of like uh, where the market is at, the trends that we're seeing, those types of things on a daily basis. So it's going to be like your data feed coming out of Sundance. Why, why is it so difficult to get information about distribution? We had that conversation. <laughs> yeah. You know, you were you were so you know wonderful to to basically be an open book and very transparent. I wasn't that open though. Like, but I, you wanted <laughs> more. You wanted to do more, but I the wanted to say more. But yeah. the distributor wouldn't let you do any well, more. Well, and they they told they let me share as much as I could. But when you sign a distribution deal, right. normally that there's that uh, confidentiality clause. Mm -hmm. And, and like, I don't understand. Like, I guess it's because it's protect them and, it protect and maybe them? it's protect the filmmaker too. I'm not going to say it's completely self serving. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was something protective about the distributor. Mm -hmm. We tend to villainize distributors every now and then in our department. And so every now and then I want to be careful. We're just trying to villainize the really shitty ones. Mm -hmm. So, some really, <laughs> some, so come. I'm glad you're so candid. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Some and good distributors might be very nurturing and may want to protect the there's, filmmaker. There's a, you know, and I've, I mean, I've been in the game a while as well. And I've seen, I've had my day with distributors. Um, I'm going to say nine out of 10 are that the shitty model. And there is that one every once in a while yeah. that is great. And that's sad. 
but it's also a layover from like kind of like a legacy uh, legacy distribution model mm -hmm. from the 80s and the you know the old 90s world distribution, old yeah. world distribution where you know this whole new aggregator and self distribution and and having access to this kind of data that mm -hmm. they they held behind the walls for so long and now we we have access to that kind of stuff um, and i think it's where everything is eventually going to go we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor And now back to the show. Well, it's still a pretty sheathed uh, yeah. culture. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is, you know, if you do our fellowship, which I like to plug as often as possible. Please, no worries. <laughs> and, uh, if you do our fellowship, you're like Jess was saying, you're required to give us information. Sure. And because we are not the distributor, the filmmaker and Sundance can mm -hmm. be very open and public about all the data. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we were taking a distribution fee or we were a distributor, obviously we couldn't do such things like that. Right. And we're a nonprofit. So we're motivated to support, we're mission based, we're motivated to support the filmmaker. Now, so I've heard so much about the Sundance Institute uh, over the years, you know, as this kind of like ivory tower thing for, you know, for filmmakers. And I know you guys laugh mm -hmm. because you're inside the ivory tower. They are. Um, but it's like really are. not ivory. It's like, no, no, they I, are no, I know the reality and the, <laughs> the reality of what it is and the re and what the myth is are two different things. Because if you put the word Sundance in front of anything, filmmakers, independent filmmakers, that's why you got so many emails. So I like, mean, that's why can I you get me in? Job. Can you get me in? Can yeah, you get me into this? Can, what, can, what can you do? What can you do? By the way, just so everybody knows, they have no power of getting your movie into we Sundance. Cannot, we cannot. Nothing don't. whatsoever. We are so sorry. They know no one. <laughs> they can get nothing happening. Okay? So please, if you email, do but not email, email us. Email yes. us to talk about other things. But that is not one of the things you should talk about. We genuinely love getting emails. Like, that is <laughs> that is something that we love. Like, like we, no other department enjoys it like No, we do. people find it very weird how much we ask people to email us. So <laughs> it's I just... How big is the department to be doing with all this? Three, three. It's, yeah, this is two thirds. Of the department. <laughs> so two thirds of the department. So you guys just like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I want to read emails. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so we're talking about like opening up the data of of helping filmmakers, mm -hmm. and you know, one thing that Facebook has done extremely well is they've created basically the most powerful marketing tool in the history of man. Yeah, whether love them or hate them, mm -hmm. and there's and there's both there's feet on both sides on that. <laughs> um, the information that they have on people is remarkable. And mm -hmm. I think it would be wonderful to be able to have even a, a scotch of that information about the filmmaking process, yeah. about how distributing you know, distribution and things like that. Is that something you're kind of going after as well? Yeah. We're, we're actively getting, trying to get data from multiple different sources, right? So we want to be working with distributors. Again, we're, you know, sometimes it might, might sound like we're villainizing distributors, <laughs> but we really aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the way that we see it right now is that uh, something needs to change within the industry um, in order for it to become more sustainable and for more people to be able to have a sustainable living. Um, so it's it, it's about everyone at this point. So um, we're trying to encourage people to be transparent, the sales agents, the distributors, you know, everybody that's in the game, we want to work with them. Mm -hmm. We We want to help them you know, we, we want to find these sustainable avenues. So, and we're also collecting all of the information within the Institute as far as the projects that are coming in and out of there. Um, and then also training filmmakers on how to use data, how to use that Facebook data, how to yeah. audience how to target, target. Audience. Exactly. how to find an audience, how exactly. to identify an audience. That's yeah. a major part of our yeah. fellowship is a digital marketing spend. You know, like we give, we're giving a digital marketing grants for our fellowship and we want them to use you know, use that money towards things like Facebook ads so that they can better target and figure out an efficient way to reach those audiences. And you guys can get that data as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, do you agree, though, like you were saying, that making it more sustainable and the industry has to change? I feel that in a lot of ways, you know, it's kind of like the old school film school model, mm -hmm. which is the, you know, let's just pop them out as much as they can because even if, or even coding. Or you know, vid or visual effects for God's sake, that they beat up visual effects artists. I'm gonna beat you until you're done, and then there's five other guys waiting, or five other girls waiting to take your spot. And I think that's the mentality with filmmakers in, in, in general in this industry. Would you agree with that? Because like, oh, like he's gonna make a movie or she's gonna make a movie, and that's great. But I got three other guys. You know, there's so much content that there's so many people that they don't care about nurturing a sustainable career because there's just such a gluttony 
of product. Mm. What do you, really what do you think? It depends on what, what do you platform think? you're talking about because yeah. I make my films outside of the system. Right. I crowdfund, I use equity sure. and I don't rely on any sort of establishment or studio funding. And so Amen. therefore I have Amen. full control over everything. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but there are platforms that are actually really kind to artists. Okay. And you know, I think a lot of that is in the digital space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's those old world um, stuck in the past distributors and production companies who may be a little bit more assembly line, like the way you're thought, thinking about, but I yeah. don't know if that's what. No, no, no. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, but, but I also think that it's not just about using data when you're in the throes of already having created your film mm-hmm. and finding your audience that way. But I, I also think, um, you know, maybe content creators can also start to use that beforehand, right? Yes. And test what they're they're looking to make, right? Um, I, I think that that's another thing. A lot of filmmakers, and this is just a personal opinion of mine, I think sometimes um, filmmakers jump in <laughs> head first with an idea no. and then get it done and then realize that... No. <laughs> Stop it. I'm in fa- Sorry. I'm in favor of that kind of way of thinking. I know. Liz I and I... Budget. Liz, this no, no, is, no, no, this but, is but, like wait. the one area where Liz and I no, have like different viewpoints. But, but I, I, I agree. That does work. With to a certain, a certain extent. With a budget. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You jumping in at hundred thousand dollars with that mentality, you're done. Mm-hmm. You jump in with a five thousand dollar micro, ten thousand dollar micro, have some fun, go do or what you want to do. Make your movie so hard that sometimes a delusion is necessary. Like well, that's delusion, how I feel. I, delusion, look, delusion yeah, I agree in this with business, that. Yeah, you have to be a little bit delusional in this business right. mm-hmm. as a general statement. Mm-hmm. Uh, just or to, faith. Maybe faith is a better word. Than faith, delusion, delusion. <laughs> a combination a of the two. <laughs> no, yeah, to be able to even do anything in this business, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, I feel that. There has to be that, you yeah. know, just to go down the arts and arts in general. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I still remember telling my dad, like, I'm going to go be a filmmaker. And he's like, what's that? Well, how are you going to make money? I'm like, well, I can be a PA. And that was, that was, that was my business plan. <laughs> really I never that was, to be a PA. I tried to be a PA. No one wanted me to be a PA. I was a PA and I learned quickly that it stunk. So I, I, I was like, post, I'm going to sit in that room. That's where I sent my boyfriend. I, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you'll like post. I, I sat in a room. I'm like, I'm going to get carpal tunnel. It's going to be air conditional. It's going to be great. People, people <laughs> and 20 so years kind. later, I'm still there. Right. <laughs> Post is where the nicest people are. They, well, yeah, it, it depends. I've been around a lot of posts. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Should, again, you were the client. Months. You were a client, Liz. Don't forget when you walked into post. Well, I was an editor. I, I trained as an editor in film school. Okay. And my my partner is in post. And like I, I was like, you should work in post production because everyone's like they're on they're they're more kind, they're more calm. There's like less yeah, breathing. There, you know, there's less stress. Yeah. They, but they can be stressful depending on. The I know. Situation. I'm like saying these things as if I know. I'm really yeah. <laughs> it's probably hard. <laughs> Horrible, just like everything else. Everything's yes. horrible. Everything. So why does <laughs> anyone even podcast. do this? Why <laughs> does anyone even do this? It's, because we need art, and we, we need. Film. And we need it more now than ever. Yeah. Without question. Yeah. And you know really what? It's a, it's a calling. Yeah. But the thing is, and that's one of the missions I, I, I have with Indie Film Hustle is I want to show people how to survive and thrive. I want to mm-hmm. show artists how to survive and thrive because. I, I'm so tired of getting filmmakers just getting eaten up mm-hmm. and spit out by the system so much. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it throughout my career. I've seen people who try to do something like, oh, it's too hard. I'm like, you're just not, I'm sorry, you're not cut out for this. Yeah. Not at this level. You're going to have to try to do something else or be another part of the of the cog and the wheel. Yeah. Um, but it's difficult. Mm-hmm. It's difficult. Even it as is. easy as it is now to make a movie, as they say, much easier than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's still extremely difficult. Which I think the challenges just changed. Yeah. Because before it wasn't the entry level, entry point uh, problem was the cost of the year. Now you can shoot it on your iPhone. Now it's distribution and marketing. Yeah. Hey. Hey, what do you, you know guys know about, about that? that? So what do you, a little so, bit of knowledge. So, <laughs> with, um, so take me through a, a, a standard project, uh, if you can, with distribution. How do you, uh, how do you approach, like uh, let's say I'm a filmmaker, I have a $100,000 movie, which I actually literally know five of them right now that have that, yeah. that I'm talking to I and consulting to, yeah. that have a movie that, you know, half a million dollars or below. I have one with half a million dollars. God bless. We're, we're working with them. Um, uh, there's like, okay, what do we do? And they've literally told me they're like, um, I, I don't think we, we were, we know that we're not going to make a money back. We just want to make as much back as we, as we can. Well, at least that's a good, that's yeah, a good start. Looking at and, it. A, and it was a great movie. It's a great movie, but they're like, okay, what can we do? What's our strategy? What, how can we do this? And, and we're working with them on that. But, um, what would your advice be with like, you know, and I know it's case by case, but like, what, what, what's the basic things that you need to know to get your movie out there? Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, 
we're big proponents of people starting to think about marketing and distribution before the film is done. Amen. Because when you can start wrapping your head around that and starting to put, you know, see your film through those lenses, mm -hmm. um, then it just makes the process easier down the line. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the filmmakers that we speak to, it's not the case. Um, but I think that this is a changing mentality. I think it will shift. Now, what, 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 what is the cause of that, you think? Why is They're it too not? too busy. Yeah. Or is it just something that's not taught in film school? Is it just something that's not focused on? Because it isn't taught in film school. Well, obviously. sure. And that's, you know, I, I didn't go to film school. And that's it's one thing that, yeah, that's one, that's one thing that lives. Yeah. yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, exactly. It's it, not done in film school. I'm trying to like create a class yeah. so that I can teach it. USC, like marketing, so, yeah. distribution, yeah. social media. But yeah. the thing is, is that I think so many times in film school, it's about, it's about being creative. It's about being the creator. Mm -hmm. It's about being the filmmaker. Um, and there's been this separation for so long where distribution and marketing is very pragmatic. It's very business minded and that the filmmaker needs to hand their film off at that point. And, you know, put it into somebody else's hands. What we're, on. yeah, exactly. What we're trying to get people to understand is that distribution and marketing is a creative process. Yes. It's, yes. it can be fun. Yes. It can Super. be, it's not, it's, it's not a one size fits all, even though so many times, um, you know, we have, we have that preconceived notion because I think that's the, that's the cycle that we see perpetuated so much in the media and so on and so forth. But it's starting to become a very creative process. There's a lot of different avenues you can take. We're not trying to evangelize self-distribution. We're just trying to answer questions with what we're doing. And I don't you know? think self-distribution is for everyone. Ex no, right. it's not. It's not a million dollar movie. Self-distribution is a beast. Mm -hmm. like you really have to be on your game yeah. to make your money back. Mm -hmm. You know, at a certain business model, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, even at the half million dollar mark, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Even a hundred grand, you know, movie to self-distribute, like straight mm -hmm. up, like I'm just going to put it out myself, market it myself, pitch it to Hulu and Netflix myself. You really have to understand what you're doing. It's a lot, and it's a it's a it's a huge resource investment. It's not just a it's not just budgetarily an investment, but it's a huge investment of time. You well, know, well, something we're trying to spread is that it's not just self distribution, right? Like we use the word self distribution. Yeah, sure, sure. It's a team, right? Mm -hmm. So we're saying for the films that we work with, we encourage them to hire publicists and digital marketing specialists, and, and if they want to do a theatrical, a theatrical booker, a booker and, you know, and the, the entire team, we don't expect the filmmakers we work with to do it all themselves. And it'd be very hard for any filmmaker to do it all themselves. So right. we, we understand that at any level. Right. Um, yeah, but, but I think, but I think if, if, if filmmakers can really sit down, like going into the distribution process, like even if they didn't start from day one thinking about it, if they could just, you know, have like a really honest conversation with themselves. And I know this sounds cheesy, but do like a, a pros and cons list of the different options that you have in front of you, Absolutely. you know? And then from there, you can really see like, you know, okay, do I want to, do I want to take a, a jump and maybe do this myself? Because maybe I feel like I'm the only one who really knows this film. I know how like, I could reach an audience. I see, I see how I could potentially market it. Okay. If that's really the option that you want to take, then let's start with budget. You know, how much do you have to put forward towards this? You know, exactly. who are you, who are you trying to reach and what are the best avenues to reach those people? You know, and, and then if you decide that you do want to go through the, the distributor route, one thing that I, a, a, a very simple piece of advice that Liz gives all the time, but I love it so much. Um, and it has to do with sales agents and distributors is if you get an offer or you, you find that there's a distributor that's interested, just do your research, you know, look mm -hmm. at their catalog and call those see filmmakers. exactly. And call those filmmakers, see what their relationship was like with this distributor. Um, you know, maybe they had a great relationship and maybe then maybe it's like, yeah, maybe exactly. Yeah, maybe they didn't talk dish, to. right? Yeah. Ooh. They will dish. We are like a sewing circle. <laughs> <laughs> We are like an old sewing circle. We will dish. If there's nothing, I mean, honestly, uh, uh, a a um, filmmaker that's been screwed over. Ooh, mm -hmm. Hell have no hell, fury. Hell yeah. have no fear like a filmmaker screwed. And they will, just from the top of the mountain, will say it. I mean, is it, I mean, true, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's amazing. And I, I've had people call me about certain producers' reps or certain Things because I was under movies. I'm like, don't, don't even do it. 
I mean, the same thing happens with crew members. We have our own internal sure, recommendation system where we say, I worked with this person or I would never work with this person. It's the same thing. Right. But the stakes are much higher when you're giving away your $200,000. If you have a bad AD, <laughs> it's all over, right? So I, Especially when they don't, – don't you love the yellers? Oh, those are I do actually like the yellers. <laughs> <laughs> that's wrong. That's the wrong answer, Liz. I mean, like, answer. I just snapped to it. I'm like, whatever you say. <laughs> um, I can't stand yellers. I just like, <laughs> stop yelling, dude. We're all professionals here. I mean, come on. Stop it! <laughs> but you like your you like your yell. Okay, now we know we all well, know. I just that like likes ADs yelling, ADs. that are like really you know. Well, you have a have strong a lot AD. of presence. You know, you can have a strong AD presence. I don't want them to let me get away with anything. Like I want like the tension and I want to fight for things and I want. Them. I see your creative process now. Yeah, feeling, <laughs> yeah it's like, it comes out in chaos. I yeah. feel like I see your creative process <laughs> <Yeah>. now. <laughs> <laughs> this is not therapy, Liz. All right. So, <laughs> 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 So when you were on set, (laughs) um, as a child. (laughs) I want to go back to something you said about how filmmakers can just start getting involved in marketing distribution just in the beginning stage. And, you know, we talk in these very grand statements about, you know, uh, general things about marketing Mm -hmm. distribution. But it could start with a Facebook post or a Twitter post and just little things we encourage. A a poll. poll. Mm -hmm. But, like, we encourage, you know. Say I or we instead of the film's title. Like, make it personal, mm-hmm. make it human, make it authentic, make as many jokes as you can make. Like, just avoid never being robotic. Yeah, never underestimate funny. Yeah, funny is mm-hmm. really yeah. Funny, Love never funny. underestimate funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or just any. Yeah. I mean, memes, memes. They haven't gone away yet. Memes I've been waiting for them to disappear. <laughs> They're still here. And inspirational, for so, inspirational quotes. Yes, inspirational I mean, quotes and memes. There's a lot of free, <laughs> easy resources just sure. to grow audiences mm-hmm. oh, at, at your fingertips. Just if you could just once you identify your audience, you can feed that audience mm-hmm. the content that they're looking for, mm-hmm. and it doesn't yeah. have to be your content. It could be other people's content. And yeah. start with your network first. You know, mm-hmm. if you're scared. Start with your friends and family, just like because I consult on crowdfunding campaigns. You always start with your friends and family first, and then you expand beyond, mm-hmm. right? So, well, I mean, do the I same took, thing here. When I launched Indie Film Hustle, when I had literally nothing, I just l- launched the website and the podcast. I had the mentality, like in a year and a half, depending on how big my audience is, I'm going to crowdfund in the future. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's exactly what I did. A year and a half later, I was like, you know, I'm going to crowdfund my little micro budget film. This is Meg, and it and, and it worked out. Because I was, but it was a plan. It was a year and a half plan. See, not a lot of filmmakers think like that. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of filmmakers no. think long term. Mm-hmm. Like you know what? I'm in a year. I'm going to do this, but it's going to take ball busting work mm-hmm. until that year comes around. And it just kind of worked out that way. But they have to start. Do you agree that this? But like I don't. I think they don't think long term because I did the same thing as for my first feature. But they don't think long term because that the data is not there to tell them how long it takes to put a film together, how long it takes to crowdfund, how long it just takes to all, do all these these I can't speak. Do all of these <laughs> things. Yeah, like, <laughs> three sips I've had. Um, so, I mean, again, not to bring it too circular and be too self-promotional. Yes, like the Sundance <laughs> Institute what? <laughs> our case study, I mean, the whole point of these case studies, the whole point of what we're doing is to be like, hey, filmmakers, this information has been hidden from you forever. Mm-hmm. So let's just tell you how long it takes, how much it takes, mm-hmm. what, how much, what financial resources you need. Like how much is a real Facebook buy? Media. Yeah. Like, what is it? Yeah. Media? What is that? That's a big, like, because a lot of people are like, mm-hmm. oh, I want to do social media. I want to do some buys. I'm like, how much do you have? I've got $100. That I'm actually like, will take you far. It, I did a 40, I did three ads and it totaled $40. Right. Yeah. I mean, but I think in, in, in the scope of what you're, like, she's, 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 like, <laughs> she's that's, like, that's lovely. Yeah. This. <laughs> no, no, no. For people who can't, for people who can't see me. this <laughs> and listening to it, Jess just looked at her and goes, that's lovely. With her I eyes. believed her. <laughs> So, no, <laughs> with no, that. No, <laughs> no um, but like, no, with $100, depending on the kind of movie it is, like, you know, if you have a half a million dollar movie, $100 ain't going to do a whole lot. $5,000 is not going to do a lot, but it can if you do it correctly and you're going to yeah. spend 100 to 500 just figuring out what works. Yes, yeah. exactly. It, and that, And that's something that they... They can't understand sometimes. It's it's a, it's a different language. It's absolutely a different language. We speak the same language, so you and all of us can have a conversation yeah, about it. But yeah. maybe not me, but I will try. I will try to keep up the whole time. I'll nod a lot. It's a uh, it's tough. Mm-hmm. I completely understand. Um, and this is an example I like to use. Before I started coding, I knew how to turn my computer on and type on it, and that right. was it. Right. Um, and I took a boot camp, and it was like a crazy ten weeks of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but that just proved to myself that, oh, this is accessible. 
once you get over a certain hump, it's right. accessible, you know? And so I, we really encourage filmmakers to just take a deep breath. Read and our I, articles. Yeah, read our articles. <laughs> um, we actually, one of the first ones that I released was basically just breaking down all of digital marketing terms. So like, what is a... So, so please break, break down a few. <laughs> oh. So what is a... CP, CP something. There you CPM. go. CPM. A, that is a cost per metric, right? Oh. So you're either basing it off of cost per click which is how, literally how much does it cost when every time is somebody still, clicks on it, still, it is. That's still that thing. was the back in the day. That yeah. was the way to do it. But now that's still a thing. Still, oh, Google, yeah. Google ads. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still a thing and it's still a thing in is Facebook. Okay. You can go for, you can go for link you clicks can, right. or you can go for impressions, which is a uh, cost per impression is basically like thousand eyeballs. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Right. right. Every and time your, your ad to reaches. Sure that they click on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we've, we've taken some time to break these things down and, and try to help filmmakers understand that this is accessible to them. These are tools that they all have at their fingertips. And it does take a certain amount of testing. But that, and you know, in the tech world, testing is like the yeah. foundation of it all. Of right. And that is a very creative process, right? It's trial and error. It's figuring out the little tweaks that you need to make in order to to hit the right people. Um, and so I think I think filmmakers are missing out when they don't play with these technologies because you can get super creative with some of the stuff that you do, mm-hmm. right? You you look at the 30-second spots you have and you're like, okay, how can I slice this into a 10-second spot that's going to grab somebody's attention like that and be like, I have to watch this, right? And, and you should have something on the first frame that grabs it, your attention. Exactly, exactly. So it's like playing around with that. It's like, it's like a game, you know? Mm-hmm. Like how can you continually optimize to, you know, to reach more points, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's a it's a very creative process. We had a really great example is um, you know, one of our fellowship films, the the director got involved in the social media campaign um and made some assets, made some quick snippets of behind the scenes footage. Mm-hmm. And that did gangbusters on Ooh, their social media because campaign. He was the one who knew the film best. Yeah, he knew the film best and his fans his fans immediately knew they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is like right this is it, you know? And so having those light bulb moments, I think are very rewarding. And I think filmmakers need to know that that is, that is very much prevalent in the digital marketing space, you know? Did you guys ever hear of a movie called Kung Fury? Yeah. Kung Fury, right? I did, yeah. It was a short film. Right. You mm-hmm. So it was a movie done by, I think, Swedish filmmakers, uh-huh. if I'm not mistaken. And they made a 80s, like, om- like such an homage to the 80s. But like to the umph degree, it was a short film. They raised like about one hundred fifty thousand dollars for the short, and they knew their audience. <laughs> that's like four hundred. That's four or five features. Either. I mean, for you, it's like twenty features. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> but um, but they made this short. It was visual effects. There was dinosaurs. There was a giant Thor. They went back in time. It was brilliant for the audience that they were going after, sure. which was. People who really love the '80s, which mm-hmm. is a broad and Stranger Things, yeah. And it, but and they, and they tapped into that way before Stranger yeah. Things, into the nostalgia mm-hmm. of it all. Right. But they were, do- and then they had T-shirts and like leather jackets. They had a VHS release of it, limited like edition. Did. Uh, yes, they did. <laughs> so Stranger Things is just copying. Pretty much, they're copying this, this Swedish <laughs> Kung Fury. Yes, uh, LPs. All it Very was cool. amazing. They have they made tons of money, but their social media was just on. Um, Point. Mm-hmm. They were just doing mm-hmm. constant memes, mm-hmm. constant video, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. they knew who their audience was. Yeah. And, and it's a short film. Mm-hmm. But also, it, it can reflect your personality. So if you're mm-hmm. like a laconic soul who's just really more poetic and really more sure. drawn to images, then just post a few photos. I mean, like, I think the other thing is that the, there's a lot of pressure can be built up about, I got to be clever. I got to post five, seven times a day. I have to it gets, write, it, you it's, know. It gets a bit it's, much. But you could do it suited to your personality. It's about an authentic voice. Yeah. Your That's audience it. your audience is going to know when it's not an authentic voice and you're just trying to fit into a mold. Um, and yeah, if you fake it, they'll smell well, it. They sniff it out a mile away. It's, it's not, it, it, maybe in 90 something they wouldn't have sniffed no. it. But now yeah. we're so savvy. We're not in a time anymore where you can just get away with cookie cutter templates. You know, no. it's not like people have so much content in their face on a daily basis. So what's going to set you apart? It's going to be your voice and you have to make sure that that's your own. 
You have to be authentic. And I think that's mm-hmm. in general with all your marketing. If you're authentic 100%. to what you're trying to be and yeah. who you are, it's going to do well, mm-hmm. at least with the audience that you're trying to reach. Yeah. As yeah. opposed to if you're just like, you know, the sleazy madman marketing guy who's just trying to, you know, pigeonhole like I, the people who love Manhattans. And, you know, yes, and we made the movie and, and we made this movie just about how the Manhattan was made. Uh-huh. <laughs> you say, you say, are you looking for investments? Yeah. Equity? Do we have equity? Yeah. Tell us more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think authenticity is such a good, and, and you were saying it's so much fun doing it. I've discovered, I mean, I've learned so much about digital marketing with Indie Film Hustle. I mean, mm-hmm. it's insane yeah. Yeah. how much I've learned doing that mm-hmm. all myself Yeah, and, and and putting all the content out. And I think one of the reasons why it resonates with people is because I'm I'm authentic. I'm like, yeah. this is well, me. Well, it's you. Mm-hmm. It's, right? it's, and, it's, and I'm out front. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not hiding behind a logo or anything. I'm like literally screaming with a gun <laughs> that looks like it's a, a Super 8 camera. Well, and also like when I emailed you, mm-hmm. you emailed me back within like... <laughs> Two hours, two hours, one hour. Yeah, something like really that. Really quickly. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like <laughs> you're reachable, you're right. approachable. I mean, that's also part of it too. It's like uh, what I hate about old – I love old Hollywood and I love the old world distribution to a degree because mm-hmm. it's responsible for some of my favorite films. Sure. But what I hate about it is that wall that oh, it puts yeah. up between audience and artist. And so all we're trying to do is say – Break down that wall as often as possible. So tear that wall another down. thing we suggest is tear that wall. Mr. Gorbachev, <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev uh, tell that wall. Like on your website, this is something I learned mm-hmm. from my mentor Peter Broderick. Is mm-hmm. like don't do an info at, do Alex at Indie Film Hustle. You know whatever it is, mm-hmm. so that people know they're reaching you. Mm-hmm. Just right. all these ways to make yourself um, at everyone's fingertips. It's a you know mm-hmm. it's a little bit of a pressure, but it's still it's a way that you make new friends. You mm-hmm. communicate with your audience directly. And you're building a community. Now, what are, what are kind of like some of the, you know, mistakes you see filmmakers make uh, when they come into your arena? Silence. <laughs> um, si- crickets. There's crickets, actually. I now. think sometimes being too precious. Oh, yeah. And I, I know that that is really, I just, I just want to, I just want to clarify, um, I am not a filmmaker, so I don't want people to think that uh, I am. I don't want to be a, a poser by any means. Wanna, what? Get um, out. Get out. I know. <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, film has been in my life in many different capacities sure, through sure. my professional career, um, and I used to work on film sets, so I'm very uh, attuned to it, but um, I am not, not a you're filmmaker. You're not on trial. You're not on trial. Um, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think that I, I totally understand this is your baby, right? This mm-hmm. is something that you've been working on for, I don't, you know, months, yes. years, decades, yes. you know. Um, <laughs> yes, I've been involved with some movies I've been working on for decades. Yeah, I mean, it's a thing. It happens. <laughs> um, but I think we're in a space right now that is so rapidly changing Damn. that, yeah, that if you're not willing to put yourself out there and try new things and figure out what works, that's just going to be a detriment to the future of your career. So um, I think sometimes filmmakers really hold on to their work and say, "I don't want to. I don't want to work with this unless it's unless it's like exactly 100% what we think we need to do." You know, rather than saying, "Let's just throw a little bit out there and see what works." You know, especially with these digital that's marketing all campaigns. The distribution. They're yeah. told, "Don't share anything. Don't show anything." Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Yeah, keep it quiet. Should, keep it yeah, quiet. Keep the secret sauce. Right. No. You should. Part of growing your audience is seeping out of information over time. Totally, totally. And it goes back to that authentic voice too, right? It's like, again, I think directors also need to be more in the forefront, right? They, they need, people need to know who they are and, you know, what they stand for and not just through their work, but by the way they represent their film and by right. the way they put their film out there in the world. And so um, I just encourage filmmakers not to be scared, you know, like... Yeah, you gotta exactly. Get out, you gotta, yeah. you gotta get out there and yeah. be in front. You know, I mean, he was the master at that. Mm-hmm. He's the one who started the whole promoting of the director. Yeah, Anna, he was the first superstar director, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I think I, I think honestly, after I think uh, Tarantino when he came out in the nineties here at Sundance, um, he became the rock and roll um, <laughs> that <laughs> so kind of rock and roll director <laughs> that everybody's like, oh, now it's cool to be a director. Now everybody wants to be. Director. Mm-hmm. But you also do you agree that it's not only um, being precious, but also expectations sometimes? Oh, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah. What do you mean my movie's not going to make $10 million yeah. and open in 5,000 seats? Yeah, the flip side of that, right? Yeah. So I call that filmmaker delusion. And I talk <laughs> about that because I have filmmaker we delusion. We all have a little bit of it. Um, but you need that to make the movie. You need right. filmmaker delusion. But then delusion. you need to stop it. Well, you need to stop it after you get your first rejections. You know what I mean? Because right. you could make $10 million. You, you could, could get into Sundance. You, you could. could be an overnight success. But then once the you know the evidence starts coming in, then you reevaluate and you rejigger your expectations. I, we're not dream killers here. But no, like, no, 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 but, the, but you no, know what? Yeah. We might not be dream killers, but the industry is. It's The marketplace will tell you. Period. Yeah. What it is. And that's the, br- that's the brutality of this industry and mm-hmm. of this business in general. And I like Filmmakers who are these gentle artists sometimes are not prepared and their skin is so thin that the first time someone knocks them down, they're like, oh, oh. no. I'm, yeah, you I'm, need to build up your skin. You've got to build it up. Skin. You've yeah. got to. It, it also that. goes back to like why are filmmakers dis- disillusioned? And a lot of that has to do because they don't have access to information. Mm-hmm. You know, they just see these like, you know, record deals being made and, right. you know. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But that's not... That's not the reality. No, it's not the reality. Well, it's also, I think, the delusion, you know, I call it the mariachi effect. You know, everyone thinks that... I love the mariachi effect, that you give everything for your film. Which is wonderful. Yeah. It's great. God, I'm like the romantic in this. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I'm I'm a big fan of mariachi. I'm a big fan of Robert and what he did, but... Um, I think that is not a model to follow in the sense of, wait, Liz, calm down, wait. I tried to sell my eggs. Wait. <laughs> I was <trying. laughs> working no, on No, no, but like, no, no, but like the Kevin Smiths, <laughs> you know, the, the, the clerks, the slacker, the that whole time in the 90s where it was these lottery tickets literally being handed out. All you had to do is get, make a movie, get into Sundance and, and you know – for lack of a better term, at the time, Harvey would walk down with a check, you know, and, and, and that at the time was a big thing, right, right, right. Um, you know, and, and life was good. You just you move up to the Hollywood Hills and you start making millions of dollars and you're good. That is not a business model. Right. That is, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, give all to your movie. Do everything you can to make your movie happen, but also don't mortgage your house. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, you know, you have three kids at home. Don't mortgage your house. Be smart about it. Right. Build up to something like that. You know, do a few micro budgets. That's why I'm such in favor of micro budget. Yeah, you know, just like, try. Yeah, go out, budget. you know, go make a five thousand dollar movie. Go do the Duplass brothers. You know, do something like that. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, rolling the dice. Or, you know, what I do is I make films as a as a hobby. You know, there right. and when I say it's a hobby, it doesn't mean it doesn't take my whole heart and I'm, you know, obsessively thinking about it every single day. It just means that I have a day job and you know, in the mornings and in the evenings. I work on the film. I think um, one of our um, uh, one of our uh, people here working with us, Adam, said a wonderful statement. Is like when you make a movie like you know for five hundred thousand dollars with private equity, or you know someone wrote a check or something like that. It's basically gambling, gambling, but hidden with the guise of art, mm-hmm. which I think is a great analogy, a great mm-hmm. a great statement to say because it is. Yeah, you you write a five hundred thousand dollar check. Oh, it's a massive gamble. It's you're rolling the dice, yeah. you know, and, and you're not a studio that can handle, you know, a hit. <laughs> yeah, but still that person, I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, I, you know, you you feel indebted to your investors and you want to make your investors happy. Right. But the investors are, you know, In cogent, you know, intellectual. They're they're capable of making decisions. Yes. And it's their decision to yes, put $500,000 into I, your movie. I agree with that. You can't take on the weight of the world. No, like, you can't. No, you can't. But there's also delusions. Of, there's investor delusion. I've seen let it. them have it and then let them give me money to make my movie. <laughs> I love you, Liz. I absolutely love you. Thank you. So, well, this went well. <laughs> this is just one. Drink a little more Manhattan. Yeah, <laughs> have, another, have another sip of your Manhattan. All right. <laughs> So, um, finally, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, what is the lesson that took you guys the longest to learn in the film industry or in life? Oh Jess's eyes God. just, <laughs> but if, you, if you didn't see this at home, Jess's <laughs> eyes just widened like I mean, a deer. How much in time do you have? <laughs> um, these these cars will run at least another couple hours, right? Uh, yeah, we're yeah. good. We're good. All right. Okay. Yeah. So. All right, this is really turning into therapy, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. That's really hard. I, that's you answered this before, didn't you, Liz? I don't, no. I don't know. If I did, I don't remember my answer. Okay. If you if, if you had an answer, if you can't, we'll move on. 
But we want to give a right answer, I think. Yeah. That's the thing. We could give an answer, but... It's just going to be thing. online forever. So just please... <laughs> Cool. All right. Yeah, that thing called the internet. Yes, it doesn't forgive. No, I'm joking. Um, gosh, I don't know. There's so many things that I feel like I could say mm -hmm. to the point where I'm like at a loss for words. Um, and I'm still trying to work through a lot professionally, and mm -hmm. I probably always will be. Um, but I think a big part is just letting go. It's really hard. I think um, I very much uh, have this perfectionist mentality um, to the point where when I feel passionate about something and somebody doesn't understand that passion, it really gets to me in, a, like, in an emotional way, like a sure, sure. visceral way. Um, and so I think that's been a big thing is that we are all different human beings and we all have you know, different philosophies. And if somebody doesn't get why I'm passionate about something, that's okay. You know, it's okay. I don't need to, I don't need to waste my energy on wondering why they don't understand my passion. So that's a really good for answer. marketing and distribution at Sundance Institute. <laughs> <laughs> good one. That was yeah. a great one. I liked that. Cool. I liked that. Cool. Great, great, great. Yeah. Liz, no pressure. I mean, I, I don't think this is the answer, but it's an answer. Sure. And it's, um, as a filmmaker, I think there are a lot of fears and worries that are in our heads. Mm -hmm. There's expectations, like all these things that we talked about today. And I think just saying them out loud mm -hmm. or writing them down as like banal as that sounds. Is, did I use the word banal? I don't know. I think you did. It's like was, my three, your 30 cent word. That word has ever been used. Okay. <laughs> right? It sounded sure. convincing it to me. It was convincing to me. Well, then, <laughs> I'm that's what I meant to say. I'm impressed. Banal. I'm impressed. Um, as, as, you know, I was going to say pedestrian. This is just <laughs> going well. Um, you know, as lame as that sounds, it's like just saying it out loud mm -hmm. reminds you that it's your fears are ridiculous and that you should just go forth with what you want. Absolutely. I mean, sometimes your paranoias get like locked up and, and start like creating delusions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just saying like as a filmmaker, if there's filmmakers out there, like we were here, we want to support you, email us and all of your fears and anxieties just write them all out to us and we'll see how we mm -hmm. can oh, you guys are like either verify or the entire them. Industry. We try. You guys are therapy for the entire It's so industry. silly, but it's, we love that. We like to do that. Yeah. So so basically what you're saying is uh, life is short, go for it. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's basically the totally. like main encompassing. When it comes to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Yes. When it comes to other things. I mean, genocide, no. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> like other things, yes. Wow, this interview has gone south really quickly. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Um, what advice would you give filmmakers just starting out in this lovely film business? Um, explore all options. Like there's, there are so many things out there these days. There are so many different resources at your fingertips. There are so many different ways of putting art out into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, don't pigeonhole yourself into one form of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could find that VR and AR are something that really interests you if right. you if you learn the trade or maybe you find that you know you have a skill in photography or you know maybe you even love doing branded content who knows but I'm mm -hmm. just saying like as a creator um, that is such a a, a rare skill to have. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think with this, as our world becomes more technologically driven, um, I think that, you know, that is just going to become that much more of an asset. So I think it's important to just explore all options and see what you're good at and figure out what works for you. Um, just because it worked for somebody else doesn't mean that it's, it's going path. to work for you. Everyone has a path. Yeah. Jess is going to kill me. Uh -oh. oh, no. Um, okay, so I grew up wanting to make a feature. It was like my number one thing that I wanted to do. And you did. And I did. And I genuinely feel like a more complete person after having made it. And, and I know that sounds I, I feel, absurd. but no it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I feel did better. You feel, did you feel that that the feature was a mountain, this monstrous mountain? Yeah. That you had to climb? And I climbed it, and it was... I, you got to the summit and you're good. I yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and you didn't do it. And sorry, you, and you did it. You did it at a fairly high level for a first time feature. You know, like well, I'm very you, proud of it. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you did because you had you know you had recognizable stars and you had a, a real budget. Okay. Uh, you know, so it was very very cool that you did it that way. Thank you. So I think a lot of filmmakers like us 
have that dream of the future. Sure. And though I want people to diversify, my feeling is a lot of people hide behind other content as a means to avoid making the project they really want to make. It's and so a, I just yeah. want to say, if you want to make the future, don't hide behind those other projects and just make the future. Or vice versa. If you want to be a YouTube yeah. creator. If you want to do episodic. See? Okay. Diversification see, is coming If you want to do episodic, don't hide. Don't hide behind the so, short. You know, it's the like. The shorts. Constant shorts. Constant Liz, shorts. These, yes. two, these two things. Go it's it's like bread and butter. Okay. <laughs> it's oh, like wow. they really like. Available wow. now on Hulu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. No, it's true. I just it think is, that like yeah. very often, the, like all the filmmakers come to me and they'll have this repertoire of shorts that they make. And I'm very pro shorts filmmaking. Sure, sure. But you know what they really want to do is is the feature sometimes. And I just want to say just just just, just make just the go, feature. Just and it. I absolutely agree with that. And yeah. one thing that you know Liz uh, is just amazing at of encouraging is just you know the micro budget space is great, right? Because yeah. you're you. Hundred thousand dollars. That's that's which still, was incredibly hard to get. Yeah, but it's but that's a good amount of money, and you can a, you can do you can do a, can do a lot with that. You know, I, what was that? What was that? It was it was it was, oh, it was under a number a that I can't say. It was a number that you can't say. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But it was a, a humble micro budget. It was a hum, it was a humble. Don't worry about it. It's a humble micro budget. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I was able, let's just put it this way with a hundred thousand dollars, I could have done a lot. Yeah. I could have done, I could probably, I could have easily done three or four features of that easily, comfortably. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Um, to but explore, it's, and there's nothing yeah. against it. Like some stories take a hundred thousand, oh. some th- take five, but the Duplass brothers are such a great model for that because yeah. they literally, like, you got a thousand bucks, go make a movie mm-hmm. on the weekends yeah. mm-hmm. with your friends. Yeah. And if it's great, show it to people. If you don't, you learned, yeah. move on. Never feel like you have to show everything. But they did, they, you know, they made their first feature and it, it, it was horrible. I actually never heard that. They went out, I, spent like $100,000 that they had mom give them the money and all this kind of stuff. And they raised money and it, they, they put it together like, this is a piece of crap. And they killed it. That they were that strong in character of artists to kill their baby. Because that's, <sighs> imagine imagine that's so crazy and they were so freaked out about that like you know we're just gonna go shoot something and they shot that first short they got in the sundance oh the the, 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 the phone the, the, the phone yeah. message thing uh the, the, leaving the message they shot it in five like i think they shot it in like 30 minutes or something like that mm-hmm. in a day on on their their consumer mom's consumer thing and oh. got in the sundance and then well, Puffy Chair came Dunham, out. Oh, yeah, and Puffy Chair. And then Puffy Chair Lena came out. Dunham's first feature, right. Creative Nonfiction, right? Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it. But, like, everyone thinks that Tiny Furniture is her first feature because... It was the one that got all the... Right, right, right. Like, like Puffy Chair. Like Sherry, right. yeah. Like Puffy Chair got. Now, uh, this is probably going to be the hardest question. Right? <laughs> so prepare yourself. Three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, God. <laughs> um. <laughs> for, for the audience at home... Jess literally crossed her arms <laughs> and pouted in the back and leaned back and pouted. God, like, I feel like all of these of questions bitch. are just like, just <laughs> these are burning what we call, anxiety. What do we call gotcha questions? Yeah, no, they yeah. are. Um, uh, what three, we, three that were that pop in your head. What we do in the shadows oh, so good. is okay. one of my favorite films. Okay. Um, I just think that film is brilliant. Okay. Um, Wait, let's tag team this so okay. we can each have time. Okay. <laughs> um, Moonstruck, because... Because Nicolas Cage and, and Cher. Because it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's amazing. There's nothing else that needs to be said. Sorry, I should have taken long. No. <laughs> I thought I could buy you like 10 seconds, but that wasn't enough. <laughs> This is gonna be so. This is gonna be just such do, a cheesy one. Go ahead. This it doesn't is matter. Such a we've, heard, we've heard everything on the show. It's all good. Romeo and Juliet. Which Wait, one? the Baz Luhrmann. Baz Luhrmann. Oh, that's amazing. What is that? I love that. Movie. I love that. It's one of my favorite I movies. John Leguizamo is really good. Movie. I I love that movie. I love that. I love Moulin Rouge too. I'm yeah, a great uh, that's our yeah. Strictly ballroom, I think, is superior. But you know, we don't have to get Listen, into it right it's now. It's okay to be wrong. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never been wrong about Strictly Ballroom. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. We can have that conversation. Yeah. Oh, it's my, <laughs> fuck, it's my turn. Um, um, I, I, I don't know what I said last time. I don't remember either. But um, I, I really love Stuck on You by the Fairley Brothers. That's a great And it book. doesn't what? get enough credit. And I try to bring it up as much as possible because I, I really love it. It's a fun movie. And it it's really like done with movie. love and care and absurdity. And All of their movies people are People should just go watch Stuck on You. <laughs> yes. Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear. Yeah. Yes. And Meryl Streep. And Cher. I, I oh, should just think right. of a third Meryl Cher Street movie. Cher. <laughs> the next Even one Mendes is Silkwood. Um, hmm? Even Mendes was in that too. I think. 
Yes. Yes. That's my obscure novel. And Frankie Mendes, right? isn't it? Frankie. Okay. I've seen this movie a lot okay, of times. Okay, stop. <laughs> okay. And your last one, maybe? Uh, I'm going to have to say Elite Squad. Um, gosh, I'm like, I don't know the director's name. Uh, he did City of God. Um, oh, yes. That was, yes. yeah. Um, that movie hit me like a Mack truck. Yeah. I remember sitting in the theater after I saw that and just, I couldn't even talk to my now husband at the time. Um, he asked me in the car, what did you think of that movie? And I said, I can't talk right now. I need 10 minutes of silence. I've had those movies. Those are great movies. And that was, it just, it hit me really hard. It was a good, it did, it, it, you know, it, I think that's what they were going for. I felt okay. that after Justice League. In a good way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't go see Stuck on You. Go see Elite Scott Squad. That sounds great. That was, that was for you, Adam. I that mean, it's you. very, it's very deep. <laughs> <laughs> Something just happened. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's a running joke. <laughs> it's it's a, it's very heavy uh, uh, subject matter, but it's a brilliant film. And yours last one, uh, Liz? Almost Famous. Oh, oh God. Yeah. That was a great one. I, 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 Jerry Maguire for me. Both. I think both why, are Why both choose? People. Why choose? I think you're right. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry's up there for me. I, I love Jerry Maguire. And Jerry so, fucking Maguire. <laughs> Think who's with it. me? <laughs> who's with me? Who's with me? Gonna and take my fish. My fish. Who's with me? You. Yes, you. You're coming with me. Do you have insurance? We'll figure it out. Um, and of course, say anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, course. I love that one speech he gives, but I don't want to, you know. It's just the best. Yeah. Guys, it's been. We could talk for another hour. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one more movie. No. There's one more movie. Actually, <laughs> yeah. there's five. So you know, sit Go down, get a drink. Um, no, I just wanted to say. Um, you know, in, in the creative distribution initiative, we completely understand how sometimes it might feel that filmmakers don't have access mm -hmm. to us being in that ivory tower. Um, but Sundance. yes, you don't want to say it. Sundance. Sundance. I meant to say Sundance. Sundance. I'm sorry. Yes. I just yeah. But obviously, your um, email is open. I was just creative distribution at Sundance.org. Creative <laughs> distribution at Sundance.org. We, we, we will put that in the show notes, yeah. guys. Don't worry. No, but um. I, I just want to say, I think we're trying to be a department that says yes and in terms of trying to find information for filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the answers, we do not claim to be the experts and have all of the answers. That's, we're very often not yeah. the experts. But 99% we, we are willing to go out there and find the answers. We, we are on a mission to find sustainable sources for filmmakers. So please email us with questions or concerns or if you want to have a therapy session, we're completely open. Or if you want us to write a piece. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we do, yeah, we write pieces often out of our out of our department and we're, if you have a really cool story or if there's something that you've learned, we're totally willing to put it out there. So please but, contact but have you, us. But have you met Robert yet? What, well, once he walked by me. <laughs> he walked by you. And I pretended to type. <laughs> to act, just you were trying to act cool? Yeah. You were trying to act cool? like... <laughs> <laughs> and I was typing blah, 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 blah. Like on the screen. Yeah. And you yell out, Bob! And just like... <laughs> <laughs> he was wearing jeans. He was not... All right. <laughs> I figured that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much for Thank having you so us. much, so much. It's been Appreciate a lot of fun. It. See you guys soon. I hope you guys learned a little bit about how important understanding your audience is and figuring out how you can get that data to be able to target your audience, especially if you're doing self-distribution. And even if you're going through a traditional distributor, you got to be hands-on when you're working with a traditional distributor without question. The more you understand about your audience, the better chance you have of getting your film out there to that audience so they can consume your content. As I've said many times before, the creative process does not end at final cut. It ends when you are done selling your movie, and that could be a year or longer after you are done with that final cut. So always keep that in mind. And as always, if you want links to anything we talked about in the show, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 218. And if you guys have a movie and have not signed up for the Creative Distribution Fellowship, you're crazy. It's a free thing that Sundance picks a few films every year, and they distribute your film for free and help you and give you money and give you data and helps you get it all out there and you're now inside the Sundance family. So why not do it? So go to the show notes. There's links there. If you have a movie, give it a shot. You never know what's going to happen. 
So, and there's not a lot of people signing up for it. That was one of the reasons why Liz reached out to me in the first place. So please check it out. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.